Hello, everyone. In this podcast, we will be discussing sensitive topics such as sexual assault. It's important to take care of yourself while listening. Some suggestions are listening while you're in a healthy headspace or knowing who you can reach out to if you become upset. Our 24-7 helpline for crisis calls based out of Central Florida is 407-500-HEAL. By contacting the national hotline at 1-800-656-4673, you can get support and learn about your local resources. There's always someone ready to help. the Victim Service Center podcast. Here we sit down with professionals that serve survivors and victims of trauma or those who've experienced violence and have conversations about social issues. This week, we are talking about ghosting. My name is Emily Mitchell. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the education coordinator at the Victim Service Center of Central Florida. Today, I have two amazing counselors uh, joining me again. They're returning. So first off, I do have Ella Shepard. So Ella uses she, her pronouns and is a licensed mental health counselor and founder of Endeavors Counseling and Community Yoga and Dance, a virtual space for movement. Ella loves working with youth and teens and uses movement and breath to assist herself and clients through big emotions and stress. Ella is also a 200-hour certified yoga teacher. So Ella, thank you for coming back onto the podcast today. Thanks for having me back, Emily. It's good to be here. And I also have returning Jordan Steckler. So Jordan uses she, her pronouns and is a licensed mental health counselor in the state of Florida. She earned her master's in clinical mental health counseling from the University of Central Florida. Jordan currently works with adolescents and adults on a variety of concerns, including depression, anxiety, stress, trauma, and grief. Jordan is also a 200-hour certified yoga teacher. So Jordan, thank you as well for being back onto the podcast. We're really happy to have both of you here. Thank you for having me back. And as a brief introduction, I'm really excited to talk about this particular topic today because many of you who are listening may have come across the term ghosting recently in the media, which according to research is more common than a lot of people may think. So new, new research by Gilly Friedman actually found that around 25% of respondents reported they had experienced ghosting and 20% admitted to ghosting someone else, actually. So that's just reported numbers. Um, So in this two-part episode, we're assuming that this will be two parts because we're going to be talking, diving pretty deep into this topic. Um, We are going to define exactly what ghosting is, the effects it can have on someone, particularly those who have experienced trauma, exploring if ghosting someone can actually be healthy sometimes, and ways we can heal and find a sense of closure within ourselves. So with that, I'd love to start off. How would you define ghosting? So I think I would define ghosting as, um, I guess if we're starting with like two people, whether it's romantic or friends, something like that, and one person disappears, stops communication, basically without saying anything. There's not really a fade out of like less communication. Maybe that's part of it, but typically I think it's like a pretty abrupt end of communication. Yeah. It seems like it might kind of come out of nowhere for some people. Mm -hmm. Is that typically kind of like they vanished into thin air like a ghost would? Totally. Mm -hmm. Yes. When I think about ghosting, I imagine the Homer Simpson meme where he disappears into the grass hedges or like the, you know, they're not grass, but the hedges. I guess I would um, define it as exiting an interaction without explanation. And like Jordan said, that interaction could be romantic. It could be non-romantic. It could be any type of interaction. So I guess when there's an expectation of continued contact and then one person does not continue contact without 
any explanation or communication about it. Right. Kind of breaking the social contract that there is a some kind of respect going on there that you at least communicate something, even if it's, I no longer want to communicate. It's just very abrupt mm-hmm. and a disappearance. Mm-hmm. I think that that word um, expectation is really important here. And I wanted to ask if there were any misconceptions about ghosting that you'd like to address. Cause I think a lot of people are using this term now. Um, I actually have several friends who, and I, and I know you talked about how it's, within romantic relationships and also friendships as well. But a lot of of my personal friends are experiencing ghosting quite frequently, it seems like. But I'd like to ask, you know, are people using this term incorrectly ever? Honestly, the first thing I thought of when you said misconception is I think people believe that when someone disappears on them, it's because the ghosted did something wrong. So I think that's like a misconception where they're taking responsibility for someone else's actions. Right. Like maybe they caused this to happen or something. Like right. That. Like, oh, I must have done something or said something or didn't do X, Y, or Z. And that's why they're not talking. That, yeah, that sounds like exactly how, you know, it makes a lot of sense that someone might feel that way. Um, if you had, you know, if you were working with, a client who is feeling that way, what, what was, what's something that you might say? I like to do an activity where, um, I have my client trace their hand and inside their hand, write the things within their control and outside the hand, write The factors and the things going on in their life that are out of their control. And, you know, the way other people participate in our lives is out of our control. Um, you know, and so sometimes that causes a lot of hurt and harm. Um, but I like to operate with clients specifically with what we have in our control. The person that ghosted them is not sitting in the room. Um, so we can't bring them that closure that they're craving, but we can try to work on their perceptions of themselves or, you know, their feelings or the beliefs that they developed about why did this person exit the relationship or exit the interactions we were having. Um, So I try to work with what's in the room, which is just the client and not the person that left. 100%. I love that. Like focusing on what's in your control. I think I would also dive into like the beliefs, like what is this experience? Like, why do you, what do you think this experience says about you? And if they do think it says something about them, like they're reflecting on them piece, then exploring that more and how, like kind of detangling how someone's actions towards or away or around them isn't really about the person. It's about the person who did the stuff or didn't like lack of communication. This I feel like is really getting into kind of this emotional boundaries conversation Mm -hmm. where essentially in my trainings about healthy relationships and talking about domestic violence, there's this important piece to it where, you know, an abuser may say something like, you made me angry. And so that's why I abused you. A hundred percent. Do you think that this is kind of similar in that regard? I think it can be similar in the taking responsibility for someone else's like actions or emotions or stuff. Cause yeah, mm-hmm. when someone says, Oh, you made me do this or feel this way, or I did this because you said did X, Y, Z that really sets you up to believe like, oh my gosh, like I, I caused all of this. Mm -hmm. So that is similar in that when someone just disappears, it's like, oh, I did or didn't do something. And they're feeling X, Y, or Z, like upset or hurt or whatever. And Mm -hmm. I caused that. For sure. And like Ella said, it's it's not in our control. We yeah, absolutely. I like that exercise that you brought up, Ella. I think that can be Mm -hmm. really empowering. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of making our own closure as far as like part of the healing journey from this. Mm -hmm. Um, You also brought up perception. And so do you think that there are other times where ever times where people may think that someone ghosted them and that person didn't even realize that they ghosted them or anything like that? Well, when we were prepping for this conversation, I thought to myself, there might be people in my world that felt that I ghosted them. You know, there might be people who um, 
feel that I exited the relationship abruptly or didn't give communication or they didn't receive the closure they needed. And so I think you might not know, right? Like I might not know. And so that's a thing to be aware of in terms of, um, you know, I, I think I'm, I'm on the same page with someone about like, okay, well, we're kind of ending this conversation or we're not really going to communicate anymore but there might be an expectation that's unknown or unsaid. I, I was thinking along the same lines where I, maybe it's a lack of communication or there is like a perception misperception. Like we're all putting different lenses on different things. And I think there's also that common, or maybe I'm speaking for myself and like with some of my friends, like in my world where we receive a text from somebody and like maybe mentally respond and then realize mm-hmm. later that we never sent the text. And maybe that's like an hour later or a day later, but the person waiting for the text might have a lot of feelings about that. And mm-hmm. is there going to be communication about it? That So that could be kind of one of those things where it might feel like, Hey, you disappeared on me for X amount of time. Like what happened? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point. And I think that, um, there's, I've been seeing a lot of talk online too of people like expressing that feeling because they're like, I'm really tired. And if I'm not responding, this could be why. And it's kind of just mm-hmm. going back to that emotional boundaries piece to it where, you know, um, if someone does experience ghosting, it really could be that person be, could be going through something completely different that has nothing to do with anything that mm-hmm. you did. Um, I know that I, I think we've all kind of been there where we're like, we kind of need a mental break. Sorry. It took me a week to respond to this, but it sounds like the difference between ghosting and like maybe delayed communication is that do the ghosts ever like come back? I think, so I was thinking of a couple of things while you were talking. Do the ghosters ever come back? I think that definitely varies like situation to situation. And I think people are, might be looking for like data or something like, how will I know it? Like what happened and why, and if they're coming back. And I think that's kind of goes back to what Ella was talking about, like with the hand of what's in your control, like no matter how many times your brain is processing it, because it is, it's a really um, painful experience. Someone disappears. Um, There may not be an answer. You may not have answers. I guess I was, I'm thinking back to the misperception. Something you said, Emily, reminded me of another misperception, which might be that the person who ghosts in the ship, whatever type of ship it is, relationship, friendship is, is bad or mean or doing something wrong. And I think that is not always true, you know? Um, so just to offer the perspective that, um, that might be a perception out there that the person who does the ghosting is in the wrong. Um, but that might not be the case always. Mm. Like taking out that like malicious intent Mm -hmm. and that, hurt humans. I mean, I think most of us can fall into that category of having some kind of hurt. Like some things just happen. Sometimes we do things where we may not have a good explanation. It may not make a lot of sense. And yeah, it doesn't mean we're bad people. We just, or a lot of us are carrying around different hurts. So we're going to act in different ways. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And kind of like whatever works for us in that moment um, may not right work for the other person in that moment. And we'll talk a little, we'll dive a little bit into why we think people may actually do some ghosting, but you already talked about a few things that when I was doing some research for this podcast, um, uh, for example, talking about misconceptions, because I think, again, there's a misconception that ghosting can just happen in intimate relationships. And actually Mm -hmm. it indicates research that it's actually more common to ghost within friendships than intimate partner relations, apparently. Mm So it found that 31.7% had ghosted a friend and 38.6% had been ghosted by a friend. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know if you have any comments about that, why you think that it might be happening more often in friendships. Um, I think especially last year, like during like the height of the pandemic, I saw a lot of memes going around saying something along the lines of like, hey, I saw your text, I see you, I hear you, and I'm too tired to respond because I'm overloaded and overwhelmed and like just trying to survive. And I think a lot of people were able to like understand, I think maybe we're able to understand and like empathize with that. And even pandemic aside, I think a lot of people are, can be in that headspace because there's so many things going on. Mm -hmm. So there may be kind of like Emily, what you said, that delayed response and instead of like fully ghosting, disappearing. For sure. And I think that it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, Ella, where ghosting has 
there has to be this this expectation piece to it Mm -hmm. that you know oh I believe that this relationship was a certain way and it was going to be maintained this way and the communication lines would would work this way but then it's just completely no communication Mm -hmm. and then it sounds like the frustrating piece to it and really hurtful piece to it is that they cannot communicate with this person to you know revitalize the relationship or anything is just completely cut off right like that communication with like dead air right Mm -hmm. I keep thinking of um a professor that I had in college I took I, I was a psychology major but I took one business class and it was a family business class And it was a lot about personalities and family dynamics. So that was the only reason I was like interested in it. And um, Dr. McCann was the professor. So I want to give him a shout out because he would say this phrase all the time. He would say, no communication when communication is expected is always interpreted negatively. And that stuck with me so much. I think he was talking in terms of like, business and, you know, emails and the professor communicating with the student and the student reaching, you know, but I think it is, it's ghosting. I mean, we didn't have that language for it when I was in college in 2008 or whatever, but that is, you know, kind of the essence of ghosting. That makes a lot of sense. It seems like that that's really what that piece is that we're trying to figure out like, well, what is it that makes it you know, Mm -hmm. um, this word that we can apply to this interaction or lack thereof, I should say. Yeah. That like negative perception, like it's automatically like implied or assumed that that is so true. It's so, so true. That's a shout out to that professor. I love it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Um, McCann, (laughs) Dr. McCann, wherever you are. Um, Mm -hmm. um, I think there's also this misconception that people who are ghosted um, cannot be ghosters themselves or those that are ghosters aren't ever ghosted. Um, They actually did this survey on dating app users. So again, this is just like within the intimate partner relations. And they found that 27% of women and 36% of men have both been the ghoster and the ghosted, which I found really interesting. And of course, unfortunately, they're separating by gender. They're not taking into account people of all genders. But I was just curious if you had any comments about that statistic. I'll just say there are like so many possibilities when you think about, I don't know, like shuffling a deck of cards. And if you think about like, Um, speed dating in terms of shuffling the deck of cards. There's so many different ways you could stack the cards and how so many different ways that people could link up and connect. And I think that the interactions between all the different pairs of potential people or, or combinations of different people that could be connecting is just like going to create a different dynamic. So it makes a lot of sense to me that you never shuffle the deck and get the cards in the same order. And when two different people interact, they're not the same person, you know, like interactions with different humans bring out different qualities and characteristics and traits and communication patterns and traumas and everything good, bad, ugly, all of it comes out, you know, in relationships. So um, I think it makes a lot of sense. And maybe it's even like bigger numbers than that too. I love how you said that. Like what I get from that too is like, there's no, there isn't like a black and white, like, oh, like if you ghosted, you're only going to be like the ghosted. And if you're the ghost, you're only going to be the ghoster. Like what Ella said, like interactions between people, like there's the two different people and then like the stuff happening in the middle and like, who knows what's going to be triggered or brought out like between different people who got different personalities and like interests and hobbies and, and like the triggers and all kinds of stuff, like who knows? Absolutely. And I think kind of like to finish off this kind of definition piece of ghosting, I was just thinking while you were both talking, you know, we talk about like unhealthy communication strategies and things like that in our healthy relationships training. And one of the things we talk about is kind of the cold shoulder kind of manipulative thing. So how is that, how would you think that that might be different than ghosting, just giving someone the cold shoulder? When I hear the cold shoulder, like with manipulation, I think the manipulation, there's that implication that there's going to be a continued interaction. 
they're manipulating like to get something else. So there's going to be further interaction. Let's if we're talking between two people. There's going to be further interaction between those two people while ghosting. There's, I think, I think if we're, we're kind of going with a different expectation of the ghoster is like, I don't want to continue communication. And maybe they come back because some people, I think some people who ghost like do come back and maybe they want to talk about it or rehash or some have, find closure for themselves, for the other person, what have you. I think typically that with ghosting, like when they're done, there's this expectation that there's no more communication. Yeah, I think there's actually a parallel and I'm trying to work it out in my brain, but I'm a verbal thinker. So let's see how it comes out. Um, in terms of someone giving the cold shoulder versus ghosting, it's in both scenarios, it's like, there's a need that's not being met, but the reaction or the way they're trying to get the need met is indirect. So it's like a passive, indirect way to communicate. I'm putting that in quotes because it's not, it's a non-communication. It's a non-verbal communication of like, I need something from you. I need you to either, you know, do something different in the way we're interacting, or I need to exit the interaction or I need something more from you. So I'm going to turn away and hope you run towards me. I don't know. Um, it, I love that. That makes complete sense. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It sounds like that. And that's what makes it kind of an unhealthy communication strategy because mm-hmm. it's not like in the quotes, quotes that you were saying exactly, Ella, where yeah. it's, like, it's communicating, but not communicating. But I appreciate right. like the lack, the, the need isn't being met. This person mm-hmm. is obviously- totally kind of looking for something else, but they're not able to communicate or choosing not to. And so they're using this yeah. strategy, but with ghosting, then, it can be different. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. It's like passive and indirect. Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was going to say in terms of communication styles. It's like, there's, it's like passive, passive, like not passive aggressive. It's passive with more passivity or with the exiting, you know? <laughs> yeah. Just not totally. wanting the deal, just kind of avoidant. Almost. Mm-hmm. Um, Absolutely. So I think that with that, we should probably kind of start diving into the effects that this can have on the person who's being ghosted. Cause we've been hinting at how it could be kind of hurtful and it can be difficult for someone to kind of heal from it. So what are some of the effects that ghosting can have on someone? Um, so the first thing I think of is like low self-esteem, um, feeling down, sad, hurt, confused, frustrated, um, questioning their own worth and value. Yeah. And I, I think part of it could be kind of difficult for someone to, it's almost like a grieving process, maybe like that's literally what I was starting to think of. Yeah. I was going to add it. Yeah. Grief. And I think, I think that there's something hard about it too, where you're like, maybe you have this hope that like eventually this personal, and then that like, at what point do you kind of decide no, I have to accept that this, and that's maybe the grieving cycles, right? Like anger. What are, the, what are all of them? It's like sadness, depression or something. Denial. Bargaining. Denial. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, yeah. And it's definitely, I love that you said cycle instead of stages because there's no, it, it's, there's no right way or linear way to grieve. And I think grief mm-hmm. is absolutely part of it. And even for any end of a relationship, romantic, I think even professional or friendship, when it comes to some kind of end or closure, there is, a, there is grief involved because it's kind of a death of whatever was shared between, if we're talking about two people, whatever was sh- shared between these two people. So it's, I think it's the same for when someone disappears on you, it's the end of something between you. And there's also that unknown of are they going to come back someday? And I don't know. There's, there's a lot of like uncertainty and human beings have a hard time with uncertainty. Mm-hmm. Relate as a fellow human mm-hmm. being. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> I, you know, you talked a lot about like the low self-esteem and like questioning yourself. And that's also a lot of um, when someone goes through trauma, that's a lot of the effects that we see with clients. Of course, everyone reacts differently, but those are some of the common mm-hmm. themes that people start feeling. And so with that, for survivors of trauma and violence, could ghosting have other specific effects? Could it trigger them in different ways? I think that'll depend on the person. My first thought is it's compounded. It could be a whole Mm -hmm. other trauma 
And I, I think we're going to talk about attachment. Um, it just makes me think about like attachment wounds and injuries and just being a human being and that we're hardwired for connection. So then if, if you experience, for example, intimate partner violence, so already this concept of forming mm-hmm. attachment with someone and connecting with someone is hard. And then someone disappears on you, ghosts you later on. That's just like a whirlwind. Also, I think that there's a lot of self-blame, right? Um, for mm-hmm. those who have gone through trauma. So do you think that right. they would be maybe more likely to blame themselves for the ghosting perhaps? Yeah, I think so. Like we were saying before that taking responsibility for other people's like actions or feelings. So if, and it's true, like people who experience trauma, especially with the intimate partner violence and DV, they typically take the blame of what happened. Like, oh, I should have known or act a different way, et cetera. So then when someone disappears, it's like, oh, I, I must've hurt them or said something. I wish I could say this to them now. Yeah. And I I also appreciate the fact that you brought up Jordan, like the friendship piece to it too. And that was actually a question on my mind as well. Um, I think, do you think that it's just as harmful when it's a friend that is ghosting a person rather than a romantic partner or something like that? I was going to think of what, it's what, what Ella said, like it's, if we're thinking about needs and needs not being met, I think it could be equally like painful for the ghoster and like one person being ghosted, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship, like needs weren't being met in either case. So there's already pain when needs aren't being met. And then when they like do that indirect communication, then there's even more pain. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about grief. Um, on that, because when I was researching this topic, people brought it up a lot, this concept of grief. Um, and then I also found that ghosting not only impacts the ghosted, but actually the ghoster, the person doing the ghosting. Mm-hmm. So for example, it can contribute to future unhealthy relationship problem solving patterns. And actually it can put them at risk for being ghosted themselves. Mm-hmm. So do you have any thoughts on that? Why do you think that that could be putting them at risk for being ghosted? I love framing it as difficulty problem solving, right? Because that means like there's hope. That means there's hope that we can learn to problem solve better. You know, Um, all people are capable of that. So I think in terms of what I was thinking of earlier um, was when one of the ways that it could be harmful to be ghosted is it can trigger um, negative core beliefs. um, Like I'm not worthy or um, I'm not lovable or whatever might come up for a person when um, someone exits the relationship without explanation. So I think that those same or similar negative core beliefs could happen for a person who exits um, the ghoster um, they might think, oh, I, can, I can't prob- problem solve. I leave when things get tough. Um, I'm a quitter, whatever it might be. You know, those similar um, negative core beliefs could rise up. And then, you know, you keep doing behaviors that confirm your belief. So that's a possibility. Yeah, I think, I think it is important to kind of get at the core of the fact that you absolutely, can, like if you're feeling like you're in this cycle, you absolutely have hope to kind of figure out a better problem solving technique that works better for you. And I love that we keep coming back to the concept of a need isn't being met. It's not like shameful for, I mean, relationships start and then they end, right? And so if the relationship just isn't meeting this person's needs and the other person isn't feeling it as well, you know, no shame in in ending the relationship, but perhaps we can do it in a healthier problem solving way. I thought of something else too, when um, Jordan was talking about DV, I think that another factor could be with trauma and people who have experienced trauma or um, the fight, flee or freeze response may come up. And even if physically you are safe, emotionally, if you're not feeling safe, your brain reacts in the exact same way. So I think um, on both sides, the ghost er and the ghost id, um, fleeing is one of the things, you know, so fleeing, but then also like being fled from, and then that bringing up a freeze or a, a fight response or, um, you know, the want to escape yourself too. Um, so I think that trauma response and that 
brain response of emotionally feeling unsafe might be a factor too. 100%. I love how you said that. Yeah. And I think that this is, um, can be kind of reflective for whoever's, you know, listening right now, like what are kind of my go-to, like my natural responses to things like danger and flight can definitely be one for individuals. And it's something that we absolutely can't control in the sense, like what our typical responses to, to things, but perhaps if we have some tools in our toolkit, we can, you know, respond in a way, I don't know how to say, but like, um, yeah, yeah that, but- that, cause I love how you're phrasing that, but to take out the shame of it, cause there's so much shame attached mm-hmm. to freezing and fleeing as, and I, I think of freezing, especially in like DV situations, so much shame, like, why didn't I fight back? That kind of thing. So there are automatic responses that our brain does immediately to protect us. And like you were saying, Emily, like through therapy and learning skills, maybe we can start learning to act and act mm-hmm. instead of like respond in ways that align more with our values. Like, do I want to be a person who instinctively wants to run when there's possible commitment happening here? Like if we're, if we're a romantic relationship when I want a romantic relationship. So fleeing is the opposite of my value here. Mm-hmm. And that takes awareness to notice and then work through like flee is coming from fear. That's going to be based on something experienced in the past. My actual value is a relationship that's being presented to me. Let's go from there. Yeah. And I think I love the way that you mm-hmm. phrase that a lot better than I was trying <laughs> to phrase it, mm-hmm. but essentially, yeah, there's like a difference. I wanted to be careful. Like there's a difference between like when there's actual danger and that's how you respond and that's how you keep yourself safe and absolutely no shame in that. You don't have to change your reaction to that, but perhaps exactly if it's um, something else where, you know, it's not aligning, aligning with your goals, whatever that may be, um, then absolutely work with a therapist on that. But I think that this is such a interesting, like reflective moment of like, oh yeah, what are my natural kind of responses to things that make me, you know, um, fearful or things like that. Um, Right. Cause I was thinking of like perceived danger versus like the original trauma. Is that what you're going to say, Ella? (laughs) I was going to say, yeah, perceptions too. So if you've been emotionally harmed in the past and you're in a relationship or you're in a some type of ship and you're trying to figure out what type of ship is this going to be. And it's looking like it's shaping out to be a canoe. And the last time you were in a canoe, you were harmed. You might emotionally perceive that this is a threat. Like this is going this direction. I've been here before. So I flee or whatever the response is. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no, no shame in that. I love that. I love the the metaphor that you use there. That's perfect. (laughs) Um, I also feel like now that there's a lot of talk about this particular topic and a lot of people are using the word ghosting and, oh, I was ghosted, um, kind of becoming this normalized problem solving technique, I should say. Do you think that people ever invalidate or downplay these effects that these can have on individuals? I was thinking about, I think other, so like, so let's say there's a human being who experience being ghosted. Um, and then they're going to their support systems and they're explaining like what, the, what happened, how they're feeling. I think a lot of other humans forget about pain and grief and how there's no timeline. So I think after a couple of weeks of support and being there, they've already moved on. The other humans in the support system could have already you know, moved on with their lives Maybe they see their friend is starting to do their normal daily routine again. So they're like, oh, like you're, you should be fine now. So then when that person expresses like, hey, I'm still feeling like off or weird or I'm having a hard time, the other humans might think like it's been, a, I don't know, a month or something, X amount of time. And they might place some kind of judgment on, hey, like you should be feeling better by now. Like, why are you still so upset by this? And I don't, I I hope, I don't think everyone experiences this, but I think a lot of people might because other humans, I think we don't want to remember how much painful, like how bad pain is and grief. So we kind of forget kind of like how uh, as adults, like we used to be teenagers and that was a really rough time, but it's so easy to forget. And then maybe you have kids or your Mm -hmm. friends or have kids or something and they're talking about how hard it is. And you're like, oh, it wasn't that bad. Like you can do it. Mm -hmm. But we weren't, we weren't, we weren't there recently. So it's easy to forget and move past it and not empathize with that person. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. It is 
bringing it back to the cycles, it's a totally up and down the process of healing from things like this interaction, for example, especially depending on, you know, someone's past experiences too. And kind of going back to like, um, you know, invalidating maybe people's experiences, I feel like maybe, you know, if someone is experiencing multiple ghostings, maybe someone's getting into the dating scene, for example, and they're like, oh, I'm just so used to it. But maybe one of them just hurts, hits them a little harder, right? I feel like it could be hard for that supporter to remember that everyone's gonna react the way that they should react. And everyone has a right to do that. But I think that it could be easy to invalidate someone's emotions when they've gone through that. I think that rejection is really hard and ghosting is a rejection. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's, yeah, you still need, you need support and you need people to be there with you through that experience of rejection and however long it takes you to recover. I like what Jordan said about, you know, recovery time isn't the same for everyone and it could be compounded and it could be colliding with other factors in your world and other circumstances in your life at the time, like, um, other stressors, you know, might not be the only thing. I think I bring up a lot of memes when I talk here, but (laughs) I think they're very relevant. (laughs) I saw this meme, um, And it's, you know, it's like a cartoon and they're carrying like past trauma on their back and like daily stressors and then the pandemic. And they're just kind of going around barely juggling all of that. And then I think on the ground in front of them, it's labeled like some kind of inconvenient moment or just some small added stressor. And that person just drops everything and they just have, they just like freak out and panic and cry. Cause it's like, like Alyssa, like we don't know what everyone's dealing with every day. I mean, I think for a time, maybe that's still happening. Like we were all kind of able like, oh yeah, like last year. And even now, like it's, or I think a lot of people are focusing on how it was last year. It was really hard for everybody. There's some kind of shared empathy there for everybody. It was really hard. But before that, and even now it's kind of like back to regular life. And we're supposed to just kind of be like mm-hmm. fine and handling it. And things are supposed to be better now. So we don't know what everyone's going through. Yeah. I think another societal factor is that we are in this moment, um, especially in like the mental health world where resilience is such a, and maybe even outside of the mental health world, like resilience is admired so much and, and grit. And, you know, like people talk about like resilience and bouncing back and recovering and the focus is really there. And I think that's not super healthy always, you know, like it's okay to stay in the sadness for a little while and be there and just, you know, let yourself heal in the time that it takes. Um, Because I I think we have such a focus on the recovery and the resilience and the ability to appear to be okay when something rough has happened. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I agree. It yeah. goes right back to toxic positivity, right? And I think mm-hmm. it's exactly what you were saying earlier too, um, Jordan, where you said essentially people don't want to remember what hurt feels like and what pain feels like. And as supporters, we may say things like, you know, um, it'll everything will be okay. And and that's yeah. you know, um, that can happen too, because I think, you know, venting over and over again can get get people kind of stuck in that rumination and we do help. And, and even I was just thinking like for the support, for someone who's being a supporter, like seeing someone else in pain, it could be really hard for them and a trigger for them. And even a reminder Mm -hmm. that pain exists and that person could get really uncomfortable and like not want to face that. So then they go into problem solving mode, like, Oh, just do this or, Oh, just get over this or, Oh, just try that. Cause it's really a reflection of how they feel about pain. And a reminder of their pain. Going back to emotional boundaries once again, that mm-hmm. is, you know, <laughs> you're not causing a reaction or an action. Mm. Yeah. And just instead of just like sitting with it and letting this person feel. And and I also want to validate again, like we already said before, no matter what this relationship was um, labeled as, like if it was dating, if it was um, a friendship even a family member could ghost, right? I mean, there's people who just kind of leave families, right? Um, Mm -hmm. That 
however a person's feeling is completely valid and okay. Um, and normal responses, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. So another question I had, because we were talking a little bit about the kind of dating world and how like dating apps and all this stuff and social media and like we're so available all the time. Um, do you think ghosting is becoming more common and why or why not? So I think I was thinking about this, like from different anecdotes, because I was speaking with a friend who thought like, oh, I think it's much easier to do that now um, and not and there. And they said something like, oh, this wouldn't happen. And like our parents or grandparents times. And, then, you know, I speak to some, you know, some humans who are who are like older and they were like, no, like this happened. This happened back then. It was almost I don't know if easier is the right word, but like it just did, it happened because you had fewer ways to communicate. So it was like, oh, like maybe you meet somebody like at school or at work and they're like, hey, let's go on a date, for example. And then they're like, I will, here's my number. Like I'll, I'll call you um, at X time to set it up, but then they don't call and you're just waiting by the phone <laughs> and, and they don't call. And I think that happened a lot. I think that was just like that version of what we're having now. Now it just feels, mm -hmm. it might feel more intense because we, it's so much more, it's so much easier to communicate. Like you got like Snapchat and like texting and Facebook and Instagram mm -hmm. and like, I don't know, a hundred other things. So like, it's so readily available that it just, maybe it hurts more because there's kind of a lack of an excuse of, you can't say I lost my number and you know, all that stuff. It's mm -hmm. like, you're plugged to your phone. Like and it becomes more of a reality of, Hey, this was a choice. Mm -hmm. And the expectation piece too, right? Yeah. yeah. And the needs. Think, that's what I thought of too. I think that there's a scene that I'm thinking of from a movie and I cannot remember the name of the movie, but it's Drew Barrymore and she's trying to date. And she's talking about MySpace messaging, emailing pagers. And like, I think it was going on, you know, three or four decades, you know, whenever that was two or three decades ago. And it's like just not that said, into you. That's the oh, movie. <laughs> yes, that's the movie. So, I mean, I think it has been occurring as long as human relationships has been a thing, but we just have this new language and we have hashtags and we have a, the ability to, you know, hear way more about it and feel more connected to other people who are talking about it. Um, so in a way, I hope that that makes people feel less lonely in the experience, you know? But I think that the experience has been going on as long as people have been interacting with each other. Um, and yeah, the accessibility piece, because there are so many different modes of communication. And, you know, another thing is like being left on red, which I think is another small facet of like, it's like a mini ghosting, <laughs> you know, like, oh, well, we were like talking and texting and then they left me on red or, um, and I think that's referred to in Snapchat too. And like, in, you know, stories where like you see it, but you just don't reply. Um, so not even just with like iMessaging where you have a read receipt, but in like, oh, I opened it and I just didn't say anything back. Um, and I think I have adolescent clients, a lot of adolescent clients who describe this and talk about it. And, and it's definitely a hurt that sticks with them. Even later, if a new conversation comes up, they still feel hurt by that previous conversation not being acknowledged. That is such an interesting point. And I'd love to kind of hear more about kind of your client experiences because I've heard, you know, personal friends get really confused about this. Like as we're moving forward in this communication, like complicated web of communication, right? Like mm -hmm. I've at some point, like talked to one person on one app and the other app at the same time. And it, <laughs> it's a lot. So, but I've heard also people say like, it's so weird. So-and-so read my text message or whatever, but they never responded, but then they looked at my Instagram story. So do you hear this mm -hmm. a lot with your clients? And then like, what are some mm -hmm. feelings about that? That's so complicated. <sighs> It is so complicated. And I think that it's sort of, it might be mindless. Like if you ever find yourself watching Instagram or no, I'm sorry, watching Netflix, but also scrolling your Instagram and just sort of like not really paying attention. I think that that might be part of the part of it is that we are tactlessly engaging with each other and and we are also tactlessly engaging with our devices all the time. So right, like unintentionally. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not on purpose, but but maybe it's perceived as though it's been on purpose. And then also to go back to the expectations, like the person who sent the message might have the expectation of a response, but the person who reads it might read it and say, oh, there's no response needed. Um, the conversation's done. And so it's a matter of like, oh, I was hoping you would reply to that photo that I sent of me and my dog. Can you please tell me what you think about it? <laughs> you know, please comment on my dog, please. Please. Yeah. Dog. <laughs> totally. What I, what I'm thinking about is like projection and like, we're telling, we're all telling ourselves these stories about what's happening. So someone sent a text and they're waiting for the person to respond. They see they read it. And then they're like, Alice, like, you're going on Instagram. You're seeing they saw their story. And we're starting to develop this own story in our minds of like, oh, they're busy. They're, or if it's like a romantic thing, they're talking to someone else. Or if it's a friend thing, they have better, more friends are closer to than I am. And we're telling ourselves these stories that maybe they don't care about us as much. We're getting all frustrated. When maybe it is like Ella said that, I mean, I think a lot of us do it. Like we're watching TV and we're scrolling through, you know, Instagram and we're not really engaging in either activity very fully and intentionally. Maybe you're having a conversation at the same time, like you're FaceTiming with somebody. I don't know. Like you have all these things going on. And then at the same time, the other person waiting is building a story in their head. Yeah. And kind of being like, maybe I said the wrong thing. Maybe I'm not interesting enough to answer maybe. Yeah. And then just kind of this rumination that's like spiraling snowball of ruminating mm-hmm. really and blaming yourself yep. for the interaction too. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I think a lot of people probably have felt this way. Um, and we're kind of getting into another question that I really wanted to ask, which was why do you think people do ghost? Um, and I have kind of noted here that we wanted to talk a little bit about attachment styles uh, as well. So feel free to jump in on that. Yeah. So I'll start with talking about um, the attachment piece, but Ella, I'd love for you to jump in to like add or like redefine anything if I um, feel like I don't say it like adequately enough or anything. Um, so attachment is super important to like how we build connections as adults. And it starts as when we're babies. Um, so let's say you have, you know, you have a baby and they have some kind of parent or guardian or caretaker. And those first, I mean, years really are like super important in how babies to to figure out like how safe and secure the world is and how to build connections with others. So if the guardian, there's secure attachment. So the guardian is very attentive, um, comes when the baby is like crying, like gives them like a consistent like feeding schedule. Cause like really when your baby's what's most important, right? Like feeling held and eating and like sleeping. So those are how we're really basing like what the world is like. So if that happens consistently, like there's like any hurt or injury, the guardian is there and that happens consistently. The baby can, as an, as they grow, develops this, this idea that like, I am capable, I get my needs met and they don't see the world as like this outright dangerous place. And I think that's, I think that can be a very rare occurrence that anyone is like fully secure because that that's a lot. Um, cause you know, we've got like humans who are being parents and they're, you know, like they just gave birth and, or they just adopted this child and they're taking on all of the care and that's a lot. So they may be inconsistent in coming when the baby cries, like the feeding schedule may not be perfect and et cetera. And they might miss it when this baby toddler is experiencing maybe even, even an emotional hurt. So they might be inconsistent and this baby might become a little insecure and develop a more anxious attachment. Maybe, And especially it's accentuated even more when there's any kind of trauma or abandonment. And they might deal with like abandonment issues and like feel like they really crave intimacy um, and they need it all the time. They want like a lot of reassurance that things are okay. So that's more of an anxious attachment. And then there's avoidant where I think parents are a bit more or guardians are a bit more neglectful and they're not there all the time. So there's a study. This is a good example where this guardian who maybe was neglectful brings the baby into a room and there's an observer on the other side watching and they play for a bit and the parent leaves and the baby doesn't cry, doesn't react at all, kind of looks up and is like, oh, like you left and then goes back to what they're doing. When typically a baby kind of reacts a bit, they're like, oh no, like my parent left, they cry a bit and they might go to play. But this baby is just kind of going to play, ignoring that the parent left, the parent comes back and the baby's just like, whatever, doesn't react at all. I think I remember this study. And I think there was also at 
maybe a different type of it. There was like a stranger that would come in as well and play with the baby. And then the baby, like the way that they reacted to the stranger too. And, and the Possibly. calming them down um, where some were inconsolable because of the fear, I believe. And then the avoidant was almost like they were angry at the parent, like, you know. Yeah. And then that baby can develop into this adult or this like human who, who really deep down craves a connection and is like super overwhelmed and afraid of it. So when they feel something real is about to form, whether it's a friendship or romantic relationship, they back up, they move away. Like, wait, I've been, and because what's happening in their brains is like, we've experienced a lot of inconsistent stuff with connection. So that attachment stuff is being triggered. And when I experienced this as a child, I felt really unsafe. So now I think I'm unsafe right now because I'm experiencing some kind of connection with somebody. I'm going to back away. Because they're afraid Um, of like the hurt that could happen. I see. So they would rather avoid because of the idea that has been perpetuated in their mind that, you know, the connection is bad, that I'll be unsafe in this connection and that I'll be safer. And it may be, it may not be like an overthought. It may just be like something in the background of this that's driving the patterns of like, something's happening. I'm feeling uncomfortable. I'm going to leave. It could be super basic as that. And underneath that is a lot of attachment injury. Mm, It's almost like, you know, the fear of being vulnerable to absolutely 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Ella, do you want to add anything to that? I was just thinking the fear of being vulnerable, but also um, a lack of insight maybe into that. That's what's happening. And, um, or, and, and that also leading to not being transparent or communicating about what's happening because the awareness might not be there of, oh, this is why I'm doing this. Um, I was also looking up Eric Erickson's stages of development because I think there's a lot of uh, overlap with um, attachment styles and stages of development. Um, the first stage of development is what you were describing, Jordan, with um, my caregiver meets my needs or my caregiver sometimes meet, meets my needs or my caregiver doesn't meet my needs. Um, and then what the child learns, what the baby learns from that is trust in the world or mistrust in the world. And it's not that simple, you know, it's, it's more complex than that. And I think we continue learning our entire lives, but there is a pretty strong belief that major developmental things happen and are formed in your first five years of life. So another stage is um, autonomy versus shame and guilt. And usually that one is associated with like potty training, like I'm independent, I can do this, or I'm afraid and scared and I'm not going to do this. So there's like, as you were talking, Jordan, I was just like, there's so many parallels with the attachment styles and with um, stages of development too. So I love that. And I was thinking, Ella, you said something about like the awareness piece or like that, oh, that amount of insight. Um, cause if there's a, right. So, cause you know, talking about this, people might be like, oh, I'm, I'm stuck this way. This is my attachment style. Like that's it. And gaining the awareness that this is like a pattern you engage in can give you the power, freedom, and choice to work on doing something different. Like this is just one piece that feeds into who you are as a human and gaining the awareness is like the first step to making the choice to do something different. Absolutely. I love it. And I know that y'all can't see it, but Ella has little clappy emoji on our Zoom call right now. And I really relate to that. And I think that that's actually a good place to kind of pause for at least this part um, of the, the first part we're going to be talking about next week, the second part to this, which is, you know, I love the empowerment piece to it, right. Um, that we're, maybe we're seeing these cycles and maybe we see, you know, are reflecting on the past, but what's so great about things like therapy and mental health and insight and all this stuff is that we can kind of manifest our, you know, what, what are our needs and what are our desires and how can we align our behaviors and things like that to get, um, our needs met and, and get our goals met as well. So, um, with that, just gonna, we're going to talk next week a little bit more about like how closure comes into play, 
Um, and then we'll talk maybe about like uh, some client experiences and ways that we could heal from it and then how we can support each other. Um, but before we do that, just want to thank you all for listening to the VSC, the Victim Service Center podcast. The VSC is a nonprofit organization that provides free confidential counseling services for victims of any kind of trauma in Central Florida. So to learn more about our services, please visit, visit victimservicecenter.org. And to everyone listening, healing is not linear and you are not alone. And I look forward to talking to you both uh, next week on the podcast. So thank you so much, Jordan and Ella, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.